Today, I am joined by South Sudan international and former Melbourne Victory footballer, Kenny Athiyu. Thank you so much for joining me today, Kenny. No worries, mate. Thanks for having me. We're going to start with my basic stock standard first question I love to ask everybody. Just where did your passion and love for football first begin? Um, I mean, I guess when we were younger, um, um, obviously it's very recorded, but um, when we grew up in the refugee camp, it used to be just like a, just a way for us to obviously just keep ourselves entertained when we're young. And then um, I just never stopped playing since I uh, moved abroad to Australia. And did you have any football heroes or idols growing up? Um, if so, who were they? Yeah, um, my all-time favorite player is Thierry Henry. Um, I'm a massive, massive Arsenal supporter. Um, but obviously, growing up uh, back uh, in Kenya, um, we used to adore all the African stars. So we had uh, Kanu, JJ Okocha. Um, I love Ronaldinho as well growing up. Um, yeah, so that's just a few of the people we used to look up to when we were younger. Those are some very good choices. Um I think most people in Australia really started to know your name when you were playing at Heidelberg. You know, you were pretty much scoring goals for fun. You're absolutely dominating at times. So what was it about Heidelberg you think that caught the best out of you as a footballer? Um, to be fair, um, Heidelberg, it was a very, very enjoyable time because, um, I don't know, you know, it was just like a, it felt like very family, like a family oriented kind of club. Um, all the boys, you know, everyone got along. There's like no egos. Um, and it was just, you know, like really, really fun. You know, we just used to go out there and, um, you know, do our best to put on a great performance because we used to have, um, I guess the crowd wasn't, you know, what you'd expect from a typical uh, football crowd. We had like a lot of older crowd and like a lot of kids. So, you know, it was just like for those people to just come, I guess Melbourne's not the best weather to come out every weekend and watch us play. You know, it used to be, um, it used to be special, you know, and the boys, um, not just myself, but like, you know, everyone used to go out there and just um, put the effort in. And to be fair, I just did my part um, in that team. We had a really good team back then. And with a competition like the FFA Cup, obviously, you know, you said with the NPL, Unfortunately, they don't get like massive crowds. They don't have a big TV deal. But when the FFA Cup runs around, you know, you've got the chance to play against professional teams, to be on TV. So just what's that like when you're an NPL player, knowing you're going to get this opportunity to really like showcase your skills? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's um, a big deal for, I think, uh, for individually, it, it is obviously a good but. More so, it was bigger, I guess, for a club. I think at Harderberg, they used to make their importance, I think, especially with the history of the club. You know, like how basically they're not recognised as well as they should be. So um, they used to, I guess, give the club um, the shine and um, put them back into limelight, I guess, like the old days. And, you know, for the players, like, I think... Um, for me as well, you know, like I think it worked out great for me because that was kind of like the launch of my professional career. Um, you know, I guess not, like you said, not everyone watches the NPL, so no one really sees what happens. And, you know, when you're on the national television, you know, like there's a few more people watching and um, you never know who's watching, you know. And I was lucky enough to um, basically get a great opportunity from um, uh, doing that in the FFA Cup. Wilkins to an aerial duel. Zara looking into the path of Ellis. A few. He might be through here. Kenny. A few. Oh, what a great score. King Kenny is on the board. Heidelberg win. Perth glory now. And after the first half where they couldn't, they couldn't. Well done. They have. Heidelberg in front. And Olympic Village going off. Cracking finish. Cracking run. Kenny A few in hot goal scoring form. That's what Heidelberg needed. They needed it before the break. They've got it after the break. Great run in behind three Perth static Perth Glory defenders and a finish in the top quarter. Not even Liam Reddy could save that. Fantastic there by Heidelberg United. What a goal. What a goal. And it is a NAB golden goal. $2,500 thanks to NAB to Heidelberg United. 
And what a goal it could prove to be. George Katsakis hooping it up on the bench. And Kenny Athew, that's his 25th goal in all competitions this season. And in 2017, for you personally and your club, I mean, you guys pretty much won everything and you scored a bucket load of goals. You even did well in the FFA Cup. And it was rumoured that, like rumoured and reported that you signed for Perth Glory, who you scored against in the FFA Cup. But you obviously ended up signing for Melbourne Victory. So what really happened there with Perth Glory? Was there ever anything to it? Or was it always, you know, Melbourne Victory? There was rumours. Because um, um, I remember, I think, after the game, I... Um, I went home after the game. Uh, I think it was a Wednesday night game or something. And I got up the next morning um, to go to work. And then, like, the thing, my phone was blowing up. Everyone's saying I signed up Perth. But I had no idea what was going on. This was literally um, just news just floating around everywhere. And um, I did get in contact with Perth afterwards. But I was also, uh, by that time, I was in contact with Melbourne as well. And for me, you know, I'm a homegrown kid from Melbourne. Um, my family lives in Melbourne, so it was a pretty easy decision for me um, at the end of the day to um, live at home with my family and um, play in my hometown. And, you know, as you just mentioned, Melbourne Victory is your hometown club, but they have massive support. They have pretty much the biggest support in the A-League. And they're a massive club that demands a lot. They pretty much expect to win every time. So when you first sign that contract, knowing you're signing for this huge club with huge expectations not just from the coaches, but also the fans. Was there a lot of pressure on yourself or were you kind of just like easy with it considering you're a Melbourne boy? Yeah, it was for me, it was more, I guess, personal personal pressure because um, when I signed, um, the coaching staff and the players are already there. Um, you know, they were, they were great with me. You know, they made, made sure like I didn't, I guess, put a, uh, fall under the pressure of like, obviously like, the big crowds or just playing for such a big club. Um, yeah, for me, you know, it was more, I guess, personal pressure to deliver. Um, and um, yeah, that was honestly my drive. But from the outside, I didn't, uh, it wasn't a lot of pressure. And especially like when I first signed as well, the club was doing very well. We won our championship in the first year. Um, and we had, uh, Bess was the main striker. So, Basically, like he kind of like took all of like the load and pressure in terms of like everything that came our way, and you know it gave me, uh, I guess, um, time to kind of like um, try to find my feet and just develop, and you know just watch him get some things off him. And what was that step up like for yourself? Obviously, going from NPL to full professional, full training. Mm -hmm. How difficult was that to adjust to? And What's some things about that transition that, you know, people at home might not realise? Um, honestly, for me, um, uh, it was a training schedule. Um, obviously, I went from training three times a week to about six, seven times um, a week. And, um, you know, the, um, the training set up back then, it was... Um, it just the intensity and um, the intensity was really really high um, in the training sessions, and I struggled to adapt for a while. Uh, it took me a few months to be honest with you, because after every training session, it just felt like I finished the game. Um, and um, you know, it's basically uh, you know they say train how you play. Um, and for me, I thought that was like the biggest difference from like the I guess the NPL to um, to the professional level because um, you know we used to train say, a few days a week and you know it's just kind of like show your face um, and train and then just get ready for the weekend um, you know it wasn't like someone constantly in the back on your back just trying to push you and make sure you keep like training at your best you know we used to just try to make sure um, we just train and be fit enough for the weekend whereas like in the profession okay you gotta go hard because you get injured then someone else will replace you so the coaches always demand like the best out of everyone um yeah for me that was that was probably the biggest difference i think almost every kid who grows up like watching football or playing football 
they really dream of making their professional debut for you. So for you, when that moment come, when you made your professional debut, what do you remember mm. about that match? And personally, how do you think you went during it? Uh, I think it was against uh, Western Sydney. Yep. Uh, if I remember correctly, we drew 1-1. One, one. And um, to be honest, I was I had like zero match fitness um, when you're coming to that game. So I remember, I don't know if it was uh, Mitch Austin. Or, we got a red card against uh, Western Sydney and we're down to 10 men. And then uh, Musket throws me on. We're down 10 men. And basically I was just, in terms of like, I guess, it was just memorable because I was just sitting there and was just like chasing the ball around for however long, like maybe 25, 30 minutes. Um, and I think Western Sydney back then, they had like a uh, very, very good midfield. So they would just kept moving the ball around. Um, yeah, I was, I was blowing after a while, to be honest with you. But um, it was, um, you know, it was a great memory because um, there was a, it was a massive crowd as well. Um, I think we played a marble and there was about, I think, 17 or 18,000 people in, this, uh, in the stadium. Um, yeah, it was an unbelievable memory um, and one I would cherish. We know you from NPL, you know, you were scoring goals for fun, but it didn't take you too long in your initial stint with Melbourne Victory to, you know, get yourself on the score sheet. So can mm-hmm. you talk us through that goal, if you remember it at all? And what was that moment like when you heard the ball, like, hit the back of the net? Yeah, it was, um, to be honest, it was unbelievable because I think we were losing that game as well. Um, we were done one nil, and then I came on, um, got us a penalty and um, obviously scored the winning goal. Um, but in terms of um, finding my feet, it was... It was pretty hard because I came to the club injured um, and I spent what probably like the first two months in the physio room. Um, and then obviously when you start training, um, trying to get into like a level of fitness where you'd be ready to play games. And then, you know, by the time I started playing, you know, it, was, um, it wasn't easy, you know, because like you start, I started questioning myself a lot at the start. Um, in terms of like, you know, coming in injured, um, when I play, you know, I don't feel like I played well enough and I go home and just like get in my head a lot. Um, and, you know, I guess when I scored that goal, it was like a kind of like a massive uh, weight off the shoulder. Um, felt great. Um, but, you know, I guess the disappointing thing is like um, afterwards couldn't like, well, I couldn't find the net um, after that end. It was, just, it was just a frustrating stint, you know, in terms of like when you feel like you played well and the next thing is you don't play for like a few matches um, and then you come back into the scene. Is um, Yeah, to be honest, that was the hardest bit for me because like um, just kind of trying to find the consistency to um, basically find my feet. Back for Kenny Ethieu. Oh, that's going to be a penalty. Dylan Fox lunged at Ethieu. Over he went. Penalty kick. Has a think about it. Puts it away with a plum. It's 1 1. Thea Harris. McGlinchey wanted a foul. Rather by Denton. Clipped it by Troisi. There it is. 2 1. Kenny Ethieu. It might be the winner. Off the bench. He's won the penalty. And now scored the second goal. How frustrating is that for you? Like, when you finally get fit, you're ready to play. You know what you can do. And you're given a chance, but it's only like a couple of minutes off the bench and then you might miss a week or two here and there. So you're not really given the chance to show yourself, but all of a sudden, like, 10, 20 matches have racked up and people have started questioning you, like your goal scoring and stuff, when in reality you haven't really given that much of an opportunity on the pitch to really do what you can do best how frustrating is that for you as a player yeah look it's not it's not easy to be honest with you um like i said it was not not the easiest time um but you know for me i always try to look at i guess the positives and um you know it's always like try to look at myself first and within myself and you know just make sure like i you know train better and better so i can get like more time um 
but you know like I felt like it just it was very like there were a lot of opportunities didn't come my way um if I look at I don't know how many appearances I made for the club but majority would, would have been like five ten minutes uh, maximum in games um you know which is uh for a striker, it's very difficult. So you normally get chucked on when you're either losing the game or chasing a game. And next thing is you come in and you just try to go 100%. Um, you know, it's hard for you to just kind of like breathe and just be like, okay, um, slow down and just kind of like adjust the tempo. Just kind of try to match the um, the tempo when you come on and just try to deliver in whatever sh uh, amount of time you've been playing. And, you know, it's, it's not easy. Um, you know, like, I guess people from outside can talk and say, uh, can you this, can you that? But in a day, the reality is like, try putting someone on for five minutes anywhere and uh, expect them to do something. It's not the easiest thing. So, um, yeah, it was, it was very frustrating. It was very frustrating. Um, and you mentioned Bess Harper a little bit earlier. Obviously, he's a phenomenal player. He's the best goal scorer that A-League's ever seen. So for you coming in from the NPL, getting to train and play with a player of his stature, what kind of stuff did he teach you? Like, what kind of lessons do you learn from Bessart? I wouldn't say in terms of T, because I came, I came in a bit older. Um, so for me, I guess when you're a bit older, you know, you uh, come in with, okay, um, I want to come learn, obviously, right? But, um, you know, it's not like we, me and him will sit down and be like, oh, you should be doing this. I just always try to learn from watching him, uh, how he trained and how he did things at training. And, you know, like here and there, he'll come and speak to me and be like, you know, Kenny, this, you should be doing this or whatever. And I used to always take it in. But, um, yeah, it was just like, it was a massive, massive, um, I guess, uh, I don't know what the word is. Uh, pleasure to be the second striker to best because, like you say, is the best uh, scorer in the history of the league. Um, just his uh, attitude, drive to win is just amazing to witness um, in person. You know, previously I, you know, I used to watch it like from TV and uh, from games, and then just to be there in person is unbelievable. You know. And one yeah. of the things about Melbourne Victory being such a successful club, and they did have success pretty much from when you joined them, is the fact that they got to play in the Asian Champions League. So you're going, you know, over to Asia, playing against some of these players that are on millions of dollars a year. And these clubs have amazing facilities and absolutely crazy fans. So what's that like for you as a player going over there, experiencing that like whole atmosphere? Is it as crazy as it seems? Yeah, yeah. Um, in Japan, in Japan is a uh, presence in like because um, they get like full packed stadiums. Um, you get the supporters with the drums jumping up and down, pretty much for ninety minutes. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it's a it's not a hostile um, kind of environment, but it's just more like a very loud. Um, passionate grounds where you can hear the supporters obviously supporting the home teams um but yeah it's uh you know it's just another thing i can add into what i've experienced in life uh playing in these big stadiums in japan korea and china and you're known as king kenny you're a bit of a cult icon in australian football and melbourne victory fans really seem to love you but unfortunately you know, with everything, there's always a couple of people who have a couple of nasty comments to say. Mm -hmm. So for you, when you were like coming off the bench and struggling to score, you had a couple of moments where like you hit the post or you come close and you said you were really doubting yourself coming home and seeing some of these like nasty comments on the social media. How do you sort of deal with that? And how does that affect a player's mental health? Yeah, look, it's not easy when uh, I guess uh, the people that you know it's meant to be uh supporting you your lowest um also, you know giving you um i guess a bit of stiff online but you know that kind of comes with territory i guess we're playing a club as uh, Melbourne victory when you know the club expects uh the best week in week out um 
And you know, when you so used to success, um, every draw or loss is a failure. Um, so I kind of understood it from that perspective where, you know, like, um, you know, supporters um, will always be supporters. Um, you know, I guess, you know, like I just said, like from using it to winning everything to um, not winning as much anymore, they get frustrated and they're human beings, you know what I mean? Um, it's not nice. Like I, uh, I wouldn't say it's easy. Um, you know, there's a lot of people I know that don't deal with it as well. But for me personally, I was, I'm not too invested on, um, I guess on online or I don't come home and I guess uh, open my um, social media account. So after games, I just go either I go sleep or I just just chill out somewhere with my friends and that. Um, but yeah, you know, I think I think you know, in terms of especially these days, we talk a lot about I guess like the mental health aspect of things. Um, there's a lot of players out there that um, are more fragile and wouldn't cope with the uh, abuse online as well. And, you know, it's just more, I guess, you can only hope people will know better and just try to um, not be as harsh, you know, try to keep everything football related. Um, not, you know, to the extent of where you go call out people's families or something to do with their race or because that's nothing to do with it, you know? Now, on to a little bit more of a positive note, because, you know, obviously with those tough topics, it's a little bit hard to talk about. It's a little bit hard to hear for anyone listening. Um, you just come off the back of a very successful stint in Malaysia with Pahang. So what made you first decide to take that leap over to Asia? Was it your experiences, you know, playing for Melbourne Victory in the Asian Champions League, or was it just you wanting to try a different challenge, wanting to take a step away from Australian football? Yeah, you know, like I've always looked at, um, I guess, football as an opportunity um, to see the world and experience um, just uh, different lives than the one I lived, you know. Um, uh, I used football as a way of making friends when I first moved to Australia from all different backgrounds. And to be honest with you, when my agent called me about the uh, Malaysian um, opportunity, I told him straight away to will take it because um, at the time I was off contract at Victory and I, I wanted to experience like a different lifestyle, live in a different country for a while and just, you know, just, I guess when I stopped playing football, I can look back and say football allowed me to live here, um, learn uh, different languages, um, meet people from different parts of the world. Um, yeah, so to be honest with you, that was my main goal was just kind of like just to give myself an opportunity to kind of see the world. And you did really well there. Um, you almost instantly found your feet. You found the back of the net. You had some good performances. So for you personally, how relieving was that to kind of find your form again, find your groove and be able to show football fans, you know, this is what Kenny Athiyu can do? Yeah, look, for me, going there, like... Um, I, when I first got there, like obviously spoke with the coaches and um, the, I was the, uh, one of like two Asian imports and then you have like obviously other foreigners. Um, and I was the main striker, me and um, this other player from uh, Myanmar. Um, and from the get-go, I spoke with the coach and I was getting a uh, first game, I think, uh, came off the bench, played 30 minutes. And then after I played a uh, full 90 minutes and I scored two goals. And, you know, just, I guess I wasn't really doubting my ability to score goals. It was more um, just getting the opportunity. And I was provided the opportunity straight from the start. And I was, you know, I just felt very comfortable. Um, and, you know, that allowed me to um, score a few goals and, you um, the team didn't do so well uh, last season, but on a personal level, um, uh, they had an okay season.
And you're now in Cambodia, which, you know, is a bit of a strange country to us Australians. Mm. We don't really know too much about it. So when yeah. you first made the move over there, did you personally know too much about Cambodia? Um, and was there anything that kind of caught you off guard that was different to what you expected when you first, you know, touched down? Yeah, I mean, um, to be honest with you, I think um, before I moved over to Malaysia, this club contacted me um, before I went. And then obviously um, I told my agent, um, prefer we go to Malaysia, but as soon as the Malaysian season finished, literally, I don't know, it was like maybe like a week or something, my agent calls me up like the club when you when you go over there. Um, and I'll tell him, look, I'm, I need to go home to Australia. I need to spend time with my family and then we'll talk. A few weeks later, my agent calls me again. I'm like, all right, cool. This, yeah, these guys are pretty persistent, so we'll go with it. So yeah, anyway, I end up coming here um and you know it's actually i'm in the capital city of Phnom Penh, so it's a bit modern um it's nice here but yeah what's called the off guard is how expensive it is up here um because they use i think most of the u.s currency more than they use their own currency um so everything for some reason is just so inflated um i went try to buy some grapes yesterday and it was like 37 dollars for you know, like a little box of grapes. I just, I, I, I just walked out. I didn't, I didn't end up buying them. That's it's ridiculous. Have you really got much of a chance to experience, you know, the food? Not so much the expensive grapes, but you know, the local cuisine, the culture, and everything. Or have you not really been able to do that yet because of COVID and because of you know being a professional footballer? Um, I mean, in terms of. Um, the food. I'm 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 bad with. I guess um, I don't like trying new things. Um, in terms of food, I eat what I know. So for me personally, I just I cook at home. Um, you know, just the usual pasta, rice, um, all this stuff. But um, yeah, uh, I barely get any time to actually um, go out in the city and uh, I guess have a walk because just a training schedule a bit hectic. And I mentioned in the introduction, you are a South Sudan international. You've played a few times for them now. What was that like the first time that you got called up? You've seen your name on the back of the jersey. You got to put the jersey on and, you know, represent your country. What was that moment like, if you can even put it into words? It's a special moment. Another one, I guess, um, another memory I'll cherish forever. Because... Um, you know, obviously moving to Australia at such a young age, um, but our family was still very much intact with our roots back home. Um, so obviously going over there, um, I used to, actually I said this in the in interview back in the day, um, where my father, back in the days, like um, when there was civil wars going on and before the country became independent, they were the ones fighting for it. and. For me, that was an opportunity for me to put the jersey on and fight for the country like my father did. Um, and, you know, growing up, I would realize my father so much and I kind of like felt like, you know, I've accomplished something, not, not even, even close to what my father did, but, um, you know, like just kind of following his footsteps in some way or another. Um, so, yeah, it was amazing. Um, it's an amazing moment. And a lot of people really talk about just how different international football is to club football. So how have you found the level of international football? How tough has it been for you? Yeah, it was... Um, I just... It was different because when I went there, we went for like a... It was a World Cup qualifier and we played against Equatorial Guinea. And I don't know if what you know about Equatorial Guinea, but they're a Spanish colony. Um, and basically, like half the team played in um, Spain second division, and there's a few in like the Real Madrid academies. There, uh, there's a midfielder from uh, West Ham back then. Um, so they were like a proper, proper solid team. Um, but in terms of, I guess, the internet, because um, it's hard for everyone to gel because everyone comes like two or three days before. And then you play games and everyone goes their own way. 
So I found, I would say, I think like club football was like more tougher in terms of you played against players that knew how everyone played and they played with each other every week. Whereas international, you know, you get more, you get crazy individuals. Um, there's crazy individuals that can do amazing things, but you don't see a lot of team cohesion. Um, I guess in the games I played, that's uh, what, I, what I kind of experienced. You've had a pretty amazing career so far. You've played, you know, A League, Asian Champions League, Asian football. You've played international football. So for you being a striker, playing all those competitions, was there ever a player that you come up against that you know you thought, man, this guy's on another level? You know, a player that goes through a real tough time that just sticks out in your mind. Oh, toughest, toughest. I've actually never thought about that question, eh? Um, if I have to say the toughest defender I've ever come up with, it has to be uh, Reese Williams um, in training because the when we, I was there with him when it was a victory and um, he just signed for a victory from Perth as well at the start of the season. And I remember when I first got there, like <laughs> he's he's like as tall as me. Um, and his legs are as long as mine. So I had like no advantages in terms of like, he used to always get his toe in before me every um, every time I had the ball. And when he had the ball, he would just like not make me like just easily. And he he, he was, he's a quality player. He's in, on the ball and off the ball. It's just, it's just so smart and so tough. Um, so I'd probably say Reese Williams is the best defender I've ever come across. And speaking of nutmegs, just quickly, um, one of the most famous moments in Melbourne victory's history, I would say, is Terry Antona scoring a very, very late winner to send Melbourne victory to the grand final against Sydney FC. But what some people might not realise is it was actually you who pretty much set that goal up and started that play. Um, You pretty much nutmegged Milos Ninkovic, which, you know, he's a phenomenal player. So for you, you you know... um, just joining the club, being involved in such a big moment that helped your club win some silverware. Just what was that like? Yeah, look, uh, let's shut down the nutmeg thing because I think I just got my foot to the ball because I have such long legs. I don't even think it was a nutmeg, but um, yeah, I got my foot to the ball and, you know, Terry, ball ended up on Terry's feet and man, he had, what, like 60 metres or whatever to run. And... You know, he went on like that amazing run and ended up scoring. And um, that 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 was an amazing, amazing win for us because talking about Reese Williams, actually, he, I remember I think he did his um, he pulled his calf or did his Achilles in the warm up, and the whole week we were preparing with Reese in there, and we are losing like literally five minutes before kickoff, and the whole reshuffles happened and. I think we ended up throwing Steph Negro in there and he did amazing. Um, and to be honest with you, I think that victory felt better than the, I mean, the grand final was amazing, but in terms of, I guess, like you say, that goal and that game is probably like more memorable than the grand final. Um, Cause um, yeah, I guess obviously the, the Sydney victory, um, rivalry and Sydney were having a great year as well that year, if I remember well. Um, so, yeah, it was an unbelievable game. And, you know, just to be there and experience that in the sideline was amazing. We're still only in March of 2022. So we've got a lot of the year left to play. We've got a lot of football left to play. So for the rest of 2022, what are you hoping to achieve? You know, what can we expect to see from Kenny Athew? Uh, me and Cambodia, and I'm um, just trying to score goals and help um, my team win some silverware here. Um, that's always my goal, you know, just try to score as many goals as I can. And in, you know, whilst enjoying playing my football as well, um, you know, that's another aspect a lot of people get. If you don't enjoy it, there's no point playing it. Um, so I've only been here for a couple of months now and I've been enjoying it so far. Um, I've missed a few seasons started a few weeks back and I've missed the first couple of games to injury, but, um, you know, I'm working to come back and, you know, hope 
help for, uh, hope to help the team uh, win some trophies this season. I hope you know your team gets some success and you get some success on the pitch. But thank you so much for joining me today, Kenny. It's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure. Mate, thank you so much for having me. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for watching. This video is sponsored by Arrow Sport. Go to the link in the description and the friendly team at Arrow Sport will help you create your own football dream jersey. Whether it's starting from scratch or using one of their many templates on their website, creating a jersey with Arrow Sports is easy and prices start from just $50. Go to www.arrowsport.com.au and make your football kit dreams become a reality.